Welcome to the Royal Academy of Music in London. My name's Mark David and I'm the Artistic Director and Head of Brass. The first excerpt I've chosen to play is the promenade from Mussorgsky's or Ravel's um, transcription of Mussorgsky's pictures and exhibition. And um, of course, it, it comes up at most orchestral auditions. And I've played it many times for many conductors. But very early on in my career, I played it for the great Italian maestro uh, Carlo Maria Giulini. And he asked for it in a very um, particular way, a very lyrical way, uh, which I'd never been asked for before. I think it was in about 1993 he came to the Philharmonia to uh, conduct pictures and exhibition. It was also, as a side note, it was also the last concert uh, with the Philharmonia with David Mason, who was famous for playing Penny Lane with the Beatles. But anyway, um, when it came to uh, start pictures, I started as I normally did, but Giulini sort of stopped me and, and asked me to play more like this. So very, very uh, broad, soft, and very, very lyrically. So I did as he asked, and of course the rest of the brass also played in that manner. And I didn't really think anything of it. I've certainly never been asked to play in that manner since. Um, but then only a year ago, I came across a book um, in Australia. Now, it is a book uh, written by a, a chap called Bram Gay, who was a trumpet player and also the orchestral manager at Covent Garden. And he related a story of playing pictures and exhibition for Giulini um, in the 1970s and having a conversation with him about it. And Giulini um, said, um, referred to the score, and the directions are Senza Allegrezza, which most people seem to think is related to the tempo because it sounds rather like Allegro or Allegretto, but it actually means without happiness or without joy. And um, he asked the Bram Gay, he said, well, you know, what is this supposed to portray? And of course, like any A-level student, he said, it's a man walking around a gallery. And Giulini said, yes, but what kind of man? I think I know your man. He is beautifully dressed, a fine suit, silk tie with a pearl pin, nice haircut, shoes shining. He is the curator of the picture gallery and he is walking around looking at the pictures and saying what lucky people live here that they have a clever man like me to choose their pictures. He is Pomposo, your man. I had to admit that he had my man to a T. So then Giulini said, now let me tell you about my man. Have you ever been to Milan on a wet Sunday? Milan is a bad place on Sunday in the rain. There is nowhere to go except church. Well, my man is at Milan station on a wet Sunday and he has missed his train. There is no train for two hours. His suit is poor, his raincoat is soaked, he has holes in his shoes. He looks across the street from the station and he can see the art gallery. He knows nothing about pictures and cares nothing. So he crosses the street with water in his shoes and he goes in. Now he is looking at our pictures. Here, the maestro rose from his chair, turned up his collar and walked around the room looking for all the world like a tramp with leaky shoes, bored out of his mind. Can you see my man? This, as it says, is Sansa Allegretto. And so I think, whilst I don't play it like Giulini asked me to with this very, very legato, I think it's important to get the idea that there is no joy or happiness in this. There are a lot of very famous recordings, maybe with Russian uh, conductors, where it has this... This very happy feeling. And I don't really feel that that is what is in the score or what the great maestro Julien had in mind. So, of course, um, advising students for auditions, somehow you have to find a middle ground. 
Um, I was talking to a colleague recently and who said, well, sometimes you have to educate the panel. Well, that's all very well, but you might not get the job. <laughs> Uh, certainly starting a piece alone, whether it be pictures of an exhibition or Marla 5, has its own challenges. Uh, um, it can often depend on whether a conductor insists on conducting it or whether he'll leave you to start it on your own. Um, something like pictures, I really prefer to take a really deep, relaxed breath, and sometimes a conductor's upbeat doesn't just allow for that. So um, you have to find your own tricks to being able to really manage that situation. Uh, sometimes it's as simple as talking to the conductor if they're friendly, but other, other than that, sometimes it's actually just taking the time you need, and let's face it, if, the, if you don't start, well, um, nothing's going to happen. So uh, you can find your own tricks and, uh, and um, ways of, of making sure that you know, you're comfortable and ideally that uh, you, you, know, you play as you like. The second excerpt I'd like to uh, talk about and play is the Ravel Piano Concerto in G Major. Um, this was the first professional recording, you know, commercial CD recording I made in my career. It's, it, it was when I was with the Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra and the music director was the pianist Andrew Lytton. And so uh, it was on the programme that we record the Ravel and the Gershwin Piano Concertos with him directing from the keyboard. And um, as this was my first commercial recording, I was very keen that, uh, you know, I did my very best being quite young at the time. And so I spent quite a lot of time uh, recording myself on an old fashioned cassette recorder and listening back and not really being terribly happy with it until I just looked at the score again and found a couple of particular things that I experimented with. And then that transformed the excerpt for me. When I looked at the part again, I noticed actually that there are very few staccato dots, even though I was playing it quite short. And as I looked at that more and started to sing it to myself, it came to sound a little bit like this. If I only played the notes short that were short. Which has a sort of little jazzy feel. And so when I then tried to emulate that, emulate that on the trumpet, first of all, slowly. And then I sped it up. It seemed to have much more of the feeling that I was after. So my approach is to play everything long apart from the notes that I've got staccato dots on. And at speed, that seems to work best for me. As I said earlier, I passed that on to some students who seem to like it and others um, are not so keen. So ultimately, um, please yourself. I've never been a particular subscriber to the idea of the, the principal trumpet as the alpha male basically leading everything from the front, if you like. I've been much more um, of the mind that you are part of a brass choir and yes, you might be the soprano voice of that brass choir, but um, let's face it, we've all heard choirs with overpowering sopranos. So it's, it, you know, I prefer to be, yes, of course, the leading voice in a brass choir, but I don't subscribe to this view that you have to overpower everybody else. Okay. Also, there are changing traditions in individual orchestras. Uh, when I joined the Philharmonia Orchestra in the early 90s, my immediate predecessor was John Wallace. Um, his predecessor was David Mason, his predecessor was Philip Jones, all who played with a very elegant, balanced approach to the, to the trumpet and, and their general section playing as well. Uh, the trombone players also uh, had a very, very noble, warm sound. And so I think, you know, I, that's what I adopted. I, I, be, I became entranced by that Philomona tradition that again had been cultivated by Carian, Giolini, Muti, uh, Sinopoli, Dockiani, all very much in the Central European tradition. My approach to the trumpet and my approach to section playing was very much informed by the tradition that I wanted to, to maintain and become part of. All orchestras are much more cosmopolitan now and they have much less of a, a national identity. Um, I, I think that is also a very good thing, but uh, that for me at that time, I wanted to take forward a tradition 
And so that's why I adopted you know, this very much um, more rounded approach to the trumpet than um, maybe I would otherwise have done. I almost discovered by accident that, that um, running in particular helped my trumpet playing. I remember coming home from work and as all trumpets, trumpet players do, complaining about this, that and the other, that I didn't feel that things were going well. And, um, and my wife said to me, um, well, the thing is you haven't been running for a while. And I rather irritatingly sort of said, well, what's that got to do with anything? And she said, well, you always complain about your trumpet playing when you haven't been running for a while. And so the penny dropped. And so I started to you know, run more regularly. And certainly I did feel, started to feel a lot better about my trumpet playing. I think that the important thing is for me to say is that it is an individual thing. Not, you know, I'm not prescribing this to everybody, but for me personally, um, I find it releases a lot of physical tension that um, I like to release in order to play the trumpet at my best. And so uh, whilst that, you know, that was an accidental discovery, it's something that I've carried on for 25, 30 years. And um, I started to become more um, involved in different sports, cycling, triathlon, swimming, uh, skiing, and uh, my basics failing if you like is that I obsess about everything I do and so I wanted to take all those disciplines as far as I could and I went as far as training to instruct in skiing and uh, competitive Ironman and things like that and in doing that I discovered a lot of parallels. The guided self-discovery is more to do with uh, realizing that again this came from my ski teaching training that uh, yes, you can tell somebody, somebody something, you can show somebody something, but ultimately they remember it and assimilate it best when they discover it for themselves. And so it's constructing, again, exercises or drills or scenarios which guide them where you would like them to go, or where they ought to go, without them particularly being aware of it. And having discovered the effects themselves of the exercises you've given them, uh, they're much more likely to remember the sensations that they need to apply um, later. At this level, at a conservatoire level or you know, semi-pro or professional level, the differences in sensation between, um, yes, playing well and then playing well but really, really easily are minute. And often it's a case of directing the student's attention to these minute sensations that is the, the important thing. I think there are two aspects. The, there's the trumpet playing side, there's a the technical side, and obviously the, which is in tandem with the musical side, playing the excerpts and the pieces and knowing them inside out. But and then of course, in an audition situation, there's the mental or uh, psychological side as well. Often they're so closely connected um, that I think it's, but it, it is very, very important to deal with them. It, again, it can be, it's a very individual thing uh, with each individual student. Um, critical is that you, they prepare as thoroughly and as carefully as they can, and that they're not taking, they're not taking an audition that may be beyond them, that basically they, that an audition is a positive experience always. Um, that's not always easy when, uh, you know, jobs come up so rarely and students are anxious to you know practice their technique and to 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 have a, a chance but um, i think there are plenty of auditions where that's a good idea but there are also plenty of auditions where you know i would advise a student against applying if uh, i didn't think it was in their interest at that stage of their development um, but um, we do a lot of mock auditions here at the, at the academy. They maybe play five or six auditions uh, every year um, in different scenarios. Some are screened, some are open. And I think ultimately it's getting the practice at those auditions that is the most beneficial thing. So one of my favourite runs from the academy is into Regent's Park, through Regent's Park and um, up to Primrose Hill. When you get to the top of Primrose Hill, you've got an amazing view of the city. And it's a little bit like being in an airplane, that looking down on these tiny boxes and these little tiny ants that are actually cars with maybe four or five people in. And you get a sense of perspective that uh, maybe in one of these tiny boxes, there's somebody fretting about a particular excerpt on the trumpet. And it, it gives you a sense of perspective that, you know, uh, often we get wound up in how important our little individual part is, even within the, the context of an orchestra, that we can often get that out of proportion and then in the in the sense of, of the, the universe of course it's a much less um, important part so I think again getting a perspective in terms of 
what we are doing is important. Um, uh, we are hopefully we we went into this business because we love music and we continue doing it because we love music and the best way to enjoy it is to keep loving it and not to worry about it too much so the sound that i would want to make on the trumpet really differs depending on what i'm playing whether i'm playing solo pieces or chamber music or you know big orchestral pieces or maybe a classical symphony so the, the sound changes and what i'm looking for in a trumpet is something that enables me to do all those things or you know, put it more bluntly, something that gets in the way as least as possible for, to realise what's in my head. Um, so if I'm playing a Bruckner symphony and I want to make a dark, broad sound, um, I can do that. If I'm playing um, a French concerto, I can make a bright, sparkly sound and the trumpet enables me to do that. Um, uh, and so it's very rare that you find an instrument that covers all bases, but um, I feel that I have now.